So now there's a massive gap of one to two year olds. So now you got new fill that you're overpaying for, and you got three and four year old that you're underpaying for, and everybody wants one and two because you can't build a brand on either one. <laughs> you know, so it's constant. It's constant. This is Bourbon Pursuit, the official podcast of bourbon, bringing to you the best in news, reviews, and interviews with people making the bourbon whiskey industry happen, and I'm one of your hosts, Kenny Coleman. At this point, if you've been listening to the show, then you know there is a whole world of investor barrels out there, and there's plenty of talk about the bourbon bubble, and if it's ready to bust because of market saturation. So for that reason, I've invited Jeremy Deffer on the show. I've known Jeremy for a few years, and he's a wealth of knowledge and has a good pulse on the market. And he got his start by working with Steve Thompson over at Kentucky Artisan Distillery and eventually transitioned into brokering barrels for investors without brands. And we discuss barrel values, overproduction issues, and if now is a good time to launch a new brand or if it's too late. It's a reality check for many people because the modern day bourbon glut may have arrived. With that, enjoy this week's episode. And now here's Fred Minnick with Above the Char. I'm Fred Minnick, and this is Above the Char. Hey, Fred, use Above the Char to lead us through a quick tasting course of common bottles that everyone has on their shelves so that we can pause and taste with you on each. That comes from Mike Kennedy on Twitter. And I just now saw this, but he messaged this to me on January 9th, and I just think it's a wonderful, wonderful idea. I want to go with a real basic one in Maker's Mark. Maker's Mark, to me, is this weeded bourbon that everybody can get, but yet we all just kind of overlook it so many times. But I remember studying its history. I came really close to actually writing the history of Maker's Mark. I may revisit that one of these days. But the crazy thing about Maker's is that in the late 50s, early 60s, it was kind of like this really expensive bottle of bourbon that everyone was like, what the hell is this shit? And they started marketing using wheat as their secondary grain. They were marketing their red dripping wax. And they were kind of the... You know, for a lack of a better comparison, they were the Pappy Van Winkle of the time. Now, there was no secondary market. There was no nobody out there paying $5,000 for a bottle or anything like that. But they were kind of what the like the high end chefs were wanting to buy. They were they were what the celebrities were wanting to drink. In fact, Ronald Reagan drank Maker's Mark, you know, when he was an actor and then became president. But. My point to that is like they're a fascinating story of of a bourbon that kind of helped bring bourbon back. And I think they're one of the most important, iconic brands for the contemporary bourbon movement. Now, the main tasting note that I get out of that is caramel, slight hint of oak and some uh, and some cinnamon. I also find that Maker's Mark is the perfect pairing of the everyday bourbons for barbecue. So here's my recommendation to you, Mike. Go get a bottle of Maker's Mark, get you some barbecue, pair it together, and tell me what you think. I'll come up with some other ideas, too, with some of these brands that are out there that are on the everyday shelves and give you some, like, three or four tasting notes to see if you pick it up. But grab that Maker's Mark, see if you get some caramel. So caramel should be the leading note. There's a slight hint of oak, not over oak, but a little bit of oak there, and a touch of cinnamon. So those are three notes that I get in uh, Maker's Mark, or at least the Maker's Mark that I tasted last. And the next assignment for you, pair Maker's Mark with some barbecue. I want to know what you think. That's going to do it for this week's Above the Char. If you want to be like Mike Kennedy, hit me up on Twitter, or I guess it's X now. I don't know what to call it, but you can just look for my handle. It's at Fred Minnick, formerly a blue check mark, Fred Minnick, but I didn't pay for that, so I don't have a blue check mark anymore. That's going to do it, folks. Be safe out there. And remember, vodka sucks. Cheers. Ed Bly and Rising Tide Spirits are back again with a new release of Old Stubborn Bourbon. And this release of Old Stubborn is a premium hand marriage of 10, 11, and 12-year cask drink, barely filtered pot still bourbon. It comes in at a staggering 123.8 proof, and the flavoring grain for this one 
which the last one was weeded, but this time it's now rye. Rich, sweet, and bold with a long finish that's sure to be another eye-opener. You can order online at Sealbox or TheBourbonConcierge.com, and you can even purchase in person at Revival Vintage Spirits, and even now with very few select stores in Kentucky. You can get it now while you can, but be sure to do it because it's not going to last long. Always find what you love at Total Wine & More. With so many great bottles to choose from at the lowest price, it's easy to find your favorite Cabernet or a new single-barrel bourbon to try with some help from one of their friendly guides. And with every bottle comes the confidence of knowing you just found something amazing. With the lowest prices for over 30 years, find what you love and love what you find only at Total Wine & More. Curbside pickup and delivery available in most areas. Visit TotalWine.com to learn more. Spirits not sold in Virginia and North Carolina. Drink responsibly and be 21. From their bar to yours, Chad and Sarah of the popular YouTube channel It's Bourbon Night bring you their favorite at-home old-fashioned mix with the new Elemental Elixir's Golden Hour Syrup. It's a custom-made syrup with notes of bold black tea, warm spices, and orange zest. All you need is your favorite whiskey and ice. No bitters needed. One bottle makes 16 drinks, so that's only $1 a cocktail before you add your own whiskey. They can also be enjoyed in other cocktails or spirits, mocktails, coffee, tea, and anything you can think of. It's crafted locally in Lexington, Kentucky, and you can get your bottle now at whiskeyambitions.com. Play Whiskey Wednesday Round 11, The Memory Game. Until June 26, each week you can win one of our 12 incredible grand prizes. Select two doors at checkout. And if they match on drawing night, you'll win that bottle. Not a match? No worries. You still score a Weller 12-year. Every $5 ticket gives you five chances to win, including four weekly bonus prizes. Get your tickets now at give270.org. Charitable Gaming License ORG 0002703. Do you ever pour yourself a bourbon, swirl it around, and then start struggling to come up with tasting notes? And perhaps you're also looking for a good Father's Day gift idea. Well, you can now solve both with a kit from Nose Your Bourbon. And unlike other nosing kits on the market, Nose Your Bourbon kits feature real ingredients for the most authentic aromas. You can smell real Tahitian vanilla bean instead of some synthetic aroma that's just made from chemicals. So head on over to NoseYourBourbon.com and enter code BP10 for 10% off your order. Welcome back, everybody. to another episode of Bourbon Pursuit, the official podcast of bourbon. Kenny and Ryan here today talking about a subject that is always near and dear to our hearts because as you start a whiskey brand, you pay too much attention, not so much of the labels coming out, but what's happening inside the industry. And it's just a constant keeping your finger on the pulse about what's happening, where are barrels going, who's doing well, who's not doing well. You're just kind of like just trying to figure out what's what's going on in the, the broader ecosystem. And and maybe even that, it's, it's like, how do you how do you see through some of the uh, I wouldn't say the tape, but how do you kind of see through the the, the curtain? The noise a lot of people, yeah. Know. Well, I mean, it's because a lot of people put up and they're like, "Oh, we're the fastest, biggest selling whiskey brand in Wisconsin, and we've overtaken this." And you're kind of like, "Well, are you? Or are you just <laughs> <laughs> remember?" Because you always say it in this week in bourbon, and it's like it's a lot easier to go from you know one to five hundred percent growth. They're like you, fastest growing company ever, two hundred percent. I'm like, well, when you sold one bottle last year, two hundred percent is pretty easy. Uh, there's a lot of fluff in this this game, but yeah, and that's the the fascinating world. And what I love about this show is that there there's so many people in the industry that people have no idea who they are, but they have like all the insight and knowledge that makes this whole thing work, this giant machine. There's so many individuals like our guest today that is just, just understand the industry, know how it works and help people navigate their way through it and make good decisions and uh, can be more excited today. I've learned a ton from him and excited to have him on so we can, I don't know, maybe it'd be a therapy session. Yeah, maybe well, another think, therapy session, something like that. And then I'm crying by the end. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And, uh, yeah but, we'll be crying in your arms yeah. is what it comes down to. My mornings used to be watching like, Good morning, America. With my wife now, it's like Mark Brown's newsletter. Oh, <laughs> like, yeah, oh yeah, every morning and, it comes in at the weirdest and, times too. And Nielsen reports, and she, I'm like, oh god, I, yeah. I just <laughs> leverage the farm. And we're... so you heard his voice there. So today on the show, we have Jeremy Dever. Jeremy is the current vice president of operations for. Avalon, but he's also been in the barrel brokering market. He's also done a lot of things at Kentucky Artisan Distillery, which you may know in Crestwood, Kentucky, which was the, I guess, 
maybe former home of Jefferson's Bourbon, but also some other bourbon brands. And we'll dive into more of that. But Jeremy, welcome well, to the show. Thank you. Steve Thompson. Yeah. Yes. And Steve Thompson, of course. He's a character. Oh, yeah. yeah. He had some stories. My favorite story was uh, Jim Rutledge gave it at the Kentucky Bourbon Hall of Fame. And basically, it's like he found this used still in somewhere and was going to drop it off at Vendome. He calls Rob and he's yeah, like, yeah, yeah. <laughs> he's so like, I was the guy in the truck yeah, yeah. that was delivering that with Steve. <laughs> and so like, he, he, he just drops it off, I think. Yeah, and well, they're yeah, like, yeah. what the hell is this, Steve? And, and he's like, well, since I need you to do this. And then they're like, well, we ain't going to be able to get to it till like, you know, next July or yep, August. And he goes, yep. he goes, well, if it takes that long, I won't have the money to, to pay you. So <laughs> yeah, so he asked Rob, he says, you want to get paid, right? And yeah. there was a long pause. And Rob says, well, yeah. And, and then Rob says, okay, I'll have it done in April. Yeah. <laughs> it, it was hilarious. And we left it in the parking lot and drove away. Yeah. <laughs> so that's, I mean, we're, we're sitting there already kind of talking about this where we started about name dropping and meeting people. And that's sort of how we became together is through uh, another mutual friend of the show, which was Tim Niddle. And you'd actually poured some of our Pursuit Spirits product at an event, and that's how we connected and through here. But I, I kind of want to get to know more about your background, like yeah. how you got into the the bourbon and the spirit side and everything like that as well. Yeah, well, it's 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 a standard story from the standpoint that it seems like a lot of the people that are getting into the industry, especially the newer ones, always have different backgrounds. You know, they worked in something and they want to get out of it, they wanted to change, or they've always wanted to start this up. So, uh, you know, I started, if we go back, you know, I went to the University of Kentucky, originally from upstate New York, moved to Lexington, finished my uh, undergrad and graduate at the University of Kentucky, got into sports management and college athletics, uh, doing a lot of research-based stuff. And then it just wasn't my fit. And then from there, I met my wonderful wife, who I'm still married to now. And she was in higher ed, and uh, she took a job at the University of Dayton, moved up there, got my MBA, worked in higher education. Loved higher ed, and I often say, as a lot of the teachers that listen to this podcast, too, are in education professionals, will say, you know, education leads you to drink, so it's the next best thing to get into the <laughs> booze business. So so I, after working in higher ed for 10 years, uh, I had an opportunity. I uh, was connected through um, my actually my sister-in-law, who knew Steve and Steve's uh, um, first wife, Vicki. I ended up calling Steve and introducing myself and say, look, I, I want to get in the industry, whatever I can do. And he says, great. You know, so he ran me through a gamut of different interviews and, you know, uh, we just had very good camaraderie. And he always said, you know, look, if if you learn and you're willing to do, you know, what's expected of you, I'll keep you and I'll pay you more. And if you don't, you're out of here. And I said, fair enough. So just give me a chance. So I ended up uh, transitioning from the education. We moved to Louisville after my wife took a job at Bellarmine University, moved down here and uh, just started uh, distilling. My first three years was actually in the distillery. Which distillery? Uh, at I mean, Kentucky Artisan. At okay. Kentucky Artisan. So I, I, I kind of go back. So when I was at Kentucky Artisan, I'm, I'm officially employee number one, at least on the on the uh, the payroll, as we used to say. I started working there, and we were just trying to figure this whole thing out. Equipment was showing up, and really the only information and knowledge that we had at the time was Steve Thompson. And of course, Steve had been in the industry for 40-plus years and was uh, president of the distilling company of Brown Foreman. His last project before he retired was Woodford Reserve, and he had worked with just a gobbles of, you know, immensely – knowledgeable people like, you know, Lincoln Henderson, Wes Hazel and Kurt, Kevin Curtis. And I mean, just a lot, Dave Shurik and all these guys. And so it ended up being that, you know, when Steve wanted to get back into the distilling business, he wanted to do it his way. So when we ended up looking for a building, it was actually a Kentucky Artisan. A lot of people don't know this was formerly an ice cream distribution center. I did not know that. Yeah, yeah. So it was an ice cream distribution center, but sitting there for years. And we just went out there, Oldham County at the time, if we go back, you know, when we started this conversation 11 years ago, everybody in the state of Kentucky wanted some form or facet to get onto the Kentucky Distillers Association. They wanted to be a KDA member. They wanted to be on the tour. They wanted to be on the Bourbon Trail. They, and they were willing to do anything. So Oldham County really opened up uh, and said, you know, look, why don't you come out to Oldham County? Yes, because there really wasn't much happening. There wasn't there. anything out there. You know, I mean, this was before Third Turn was there. I mean, really, the only the only tourism, quote unquote, thing that was that was exceptionally doing well out there was Udell Botanical Garden. And it just so happened, Kentucky Artisan is right next to it. So it worked out really well where we could piggyback off of their tourism. And then, of course, they loved us. So we had they had more people to pull. And, you know, they always used to say, um, Paul Cabernero, who's the director over there, always used to say, he goes, when people come in here, it's usually the couples and the women love to have this and the daughters and the, and the guys are kind of into it for the first 20 minutes and then they're looking for an excuse to get out of there. So we send the guys right the next door. So Perfect. It worked out well. But yeah, so, you know, we ended up getting going. You know, it was it was kind of, we're known as the Frankenstein Distillery. We started off moving in equipment and sourcing uh, um, uh, used equipment from all over the city and all over the state because, as you know, a lot of distilleries, as they continue to grow, they need to expand. They bring in larger fermenters. Well, they got to do something with the older ones. So one of our owners 
Lawyers uh, actually owns Special Projects International here in town, and that's oh, SPI. all he does. I've, yeah. I've heard of that. Yeah, so Mike Loring is one of the uh, one of the owners of Kentucky Artisan, and he started loaning us equipment and, and tanks and everything else that we needed in order for us to get it going. And we built it on the cheap. And you know, Steve always, you know, his motto was just figure it out. You know, none of us in there were classically trained distillers. None of us in there knew really knew what we were doing. We were we kind of had known what we were doing. And then when we started rolling barrels and figuring this out and dumping barrels and bottling, and we were kind of doing so many different things, we ended up hiring um, another guy that you know, um, Trip Stimson came in. Yeah, I've, I've heard of that name. Or yeah. Two. He, he's, so, a, he's a guy with a beard that wears Carhartts. Yeah, right? yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> he used to work at Kentucky Artisan, and he shaved every single day. He used to hate really? Scubble. Hated it. Hated it. Oh, that's funny, because Trip at Barrel now, he's, he's, he's your grizzly yeah, guy. Yeah, he's the exact oh, yeah. opposite. Now, you know, now he's out cutting down trees out at his cabin. <laughs> yeah. um, but, you know, so Trip came in, and he was very bad beneficial, just left Brown Foreman, uh, is a masterful blender, uh, really came in and helped myself and several of the other first time and the employees to better understand the actual process. And as of course, as the process went from 125 gallon still to a 350 gallon still to a 700 gallon still to 1125 gallon still, we just kept bringing in equipment and we just trying to figure it out because nothing in our distillery up until really 2020, when we took in our column still was scaled correctly. I mean, nothing was, you know, we had, you know, 1800 gallon fermenters that we ended up split in three ways to feed three different stills. And then we would collect the distillate and then run it through our 1125 gallon twice a week to do a stripping run. So, or excuse me, a finishing run. So it was, uh, it was just a real learning process. You know, we watched YouTube videos and we would get old junky diaphragm pumps and, uh, you know, pneumatic pumps and all these other types of things. And we just kind of figured it out. But as, as the distillery started to grow, we needed to hire more people. And then my responsibility shifted more to a lot of the administrative. So I handle a lot of the compliance, dealing with a lot of the clients, new fill production contracts, bringing in a lot of the raw materials, doing a lot of the forecasting. And then as we slowly started growing off, then there was different things in place where when Jefferson's came to us, you know, they wanted to kind of shake that stigma of being a, a source brand. And they were really growing by leaps and bounds. And at the time, they were owned by Castle Brands, and they really wanted to position themselves to sell. And we understood that. Um, so we were just going to be kind of another uh, part of that whole selling strategy that Castle Brands had. And in turn, they came to us and they said, and this is typical Steve, as we were talking earlier, you know, Jefferson's came to us and said, we want to be the home. We want to work with you. But here's the thing. We need a tour center. And we never wanted to be a tour center. You know, yeah. I mean, it just requires a lot of work and a lot of management. Then you get in compliance and ABC and distributors and yada, yada. And we said, no, we really don't want to do that. And then they said, well, we'll tie up 80% of your capacity on your bottling line and your manufacturing and your warehousing. And, All right, well, we'll do it. <laughs> I'll twist my arm. <laughs> and at the time, you know, we were in the meeting. It was myself and Trey, another gentleman by the name of John Glover and Steve and we're all sitting around trying to figure this thing out. And they said, um, we said, well, we're going to need about 5,000 barrels a year at the time. Well, we were only making about 1,800 at the year. And without hesitation, Steve says, we'll get you 5,000. We'll get you 5,000. And, and, and I can so imagine we'll where this goes. Another steel yeah, off the so road, you, saw the road. So typical Steve, <laughs> by Monday, more equipment, more fermenters, more cookers, everything was showing up. And we somehow figured it out. Um, and then at the you know as we started to slowly develop and become more profitable, we ended up building a warehouse, and then we built another warehouse, and we built another warehouse. So my last project, by the time – when I started, there was only three employees, and we were only making probably at that time probably about 130 barrels. And by the time I left, we were making about 5,000 barrels a year, and we had three warehouses, and we had about 25,000 barrels in our roof. Um, and, of course, by that time, we also had about 18 employees, including tour guides. So it really just kind of took on a life of its own. And uh, – I had an opportunity to go with a, a small startup at the time. And, of course, everybody was on kind of the Casa Amigos, George Clooney. Everybody can get rich in this business if you're a celebrity. So I was approached by a series of celebrities back in 2018 and said, we're going to build an organic style of vodka as well as a flavored whiskey. We're really going to penetrate the market. And, and looking back, it's kind of funny because I, I knew kind of the writing was on the wall. First thing they said is that we're going to take over Fireball. Yeah, no, right. no good luck. Yeah, yeah, shoot for five percent, you'll do fine. <laughs> yeah, don't try um, to boil the ocean. Yeah, so I stuck with them for two years. COVID hit. Most of our marketing was based around all inclusive resorts, vacation destinations. COVID hit. Nobody's traveling. So they came to me. They offered me a buyout. And at that time, I'd still been working with Steve on a number of different projects and stuff. And then um, when I called him and I said, "Look, I'm going to be leaving. If you need anything, let me know." And he says, "I'll see you on Monday. I need you to start managing Whiskey Row, which is what I was with uh, up until he passed, um, and even." after he passed, affiliated with the estate. And he said, you know, look, I'm working with a company out of California. We're going to start doing sales and distribution. So Whiskey Row, within a matter of three years, went from about 500 cases just in the state of Kentucky to 18,000 cases in 23 states. So he really needed help doing that. Um, and even Steve said, you know, he goes, I'm, I'm getting too old for this shit. So help me out here. So 
as he continued to get older, we would just continue to do different projects and I would help him in a lot of his personal stuff. And he had settled down in a retirement house on a horse farm out in LaGrange and I just kind of helped him out and we just kind of developed a real camaraderie and he was a good mentor and a good friend. And then from there, he ended up passing uh, September of 2021. And then I was locked up into the estate and helping them sell it. So the, the good news at the end of the tunnel with all this is that, uh, you know, we recently sold the brand to a wonderful company. And most of the guys that are affiliated with this brand company were friends of Steve. And they had all had made their money in other brands and spirits industry stuff. So they kind of are getting oh, the, get the band back together, yeah. yeah, which is kind of fun. You know, they sat on the sidelines for 18 months. They made their money. They couldn't do the non-competes. And like day one after the non-compete, they said, let's go. So, um, so it's good, knowledgeable people, good, smart, executive style people and people in the spirits industry. So it's, uh, it's been a very non-traditional route, but looking back out of all the people that I communicated with, Steve was definitely the precedent for me, but you know, Kevin Curtis was very helpful. Uh, Donna Willis and, uh, you know, Joe Maglioka and Pete Kamer. I mean, you know, I could go on and on. The list is just endless, but, um, but it's a great industry and I've really enjoyed it. And hard to believe now it's 11 years later. That's yeah, that's quite the background right yeah. there. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, I know. yeah it is. And a lot of, a lot of, say, a lot of name dropping. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. But it's fun, you know, and, and, you know, I don't work technically with Kentucky Artisan anymore. You know, I send a lot of work to them. Of course, I still communicate with Jade Peterson. And then, uh, unfortunately, about two weeks ago, um, Chris Miller, the gentleman that took over for me when I left, passed away. So we were out there kind of, um, you know, having conversations and sharing some good times and seeing how everything has changed. So, but no, it's fun. And, you know, I still talk to all the guys. Well, it sounds like everything that you've gotten into has just been haphazard. It's not like you you set out in a way. It's just kind of like somebody says, "Here, just go figure this out," yeah, and that's yeah. and that's not a ten year roadmap yeah, or anything. You know, yeah, and that was Steve's push. You know, with his distillery business, you know, we always said if you had the right attitude, we can teach you to distill. We can teach you to roll a barrel. We can do all these things. Because, you know, at the time we really couldn't afford, you know, chemical and civil engineers to come in and really fabricate this thing or bring in, you know, a lot of these engineering design firms. And, you know, like we used to have Rob come in and, you know, we would pay Rob and Bourbon most of the time for him to come in or Rob at <laughs> Sherman and, you know. Yeah, from Vendome. Yeah, yeah. You know, and Mike would come in and, and, you know, and then they would just walk in and shake their heads and then they would all say, and even Rutledge said this too, it was brilliant. You know, Pete and Jim Rutledge, you know, just a, a wonderful knowledge of the industry. He would come in and say, Steve, I don't know how the hell all this works. I, I just, I don't know how you do it. So, you know, it's fine. You know, our, our first mill was, uh, you know, because I talk about a lot of the used equipment, our first mill was actually a uh, pet food mill. <laughs> so <laughs> really? corn would come in and that would grind up. So we we ripped it out of a pet food, you know, facility. And then a lot of our tanks came from, uh, um, at the time, it was called the Carriage House Bottling Facility out there in LaGrange. And it used to stew tomatoes. So we would, we ripped off the tops, took them to Vendome, fabricated them, put some cooling coils in them. Voila, we got fermenters, you know. So it was just, it was fun stuff like that, you know. <laughs> yeah, it's, I, I never, ingenuity. I never yeah, oh yeah. yeah, oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Thank God for J.B. Weld and duct tape. <laughs> it saved us a lot. <laughs> so the other thing I kind of wanted, because I, that kind of set me off on the next question is is kind of like these at some point how did you get into the, the barrel brokering side of things because i think this is interesting from a, a two different perspectives for anybody that's new that's listening to this they're probably going like what is this whole kind of like middle layer that i've never heard of before some people that have been listening to bourbon pursuit for a while they understand that there is there is this thing called sourcing there is this whole open market of things but kind of talk a little bit about that and sort of like how you got your hands dirty into it as well. Kind of non-traditionally, um, you know, when I was working for Steve, people would call him because of his knowledge and he would just say, you know, Steve, I want to build a brand, you know, and and I, like I was joking with you earlier, you know, people call up Steve and say, Steve, I want to build a brand. I got $5 million. And the first thing out of his mouth is he said, well, come back to me when you have 10. You know, so he would always <laughs> double it because you can never have enough money to build a brand, at least in certain ways. You can be creative, but you always need money. So as people kept coming to him, you know, he was doing some consulting, but he had Kentucky artists and we had the brand and he was doing a number of different things. So he said, you know, Jeremy, just here, call this guy, figure out what the hell he wants. So I just started calling and calling and, you know, and then it just slowly came together. And then as I started developing, you know, different types of forecasting models and sourcing of the raw materials, and you just, as you know, the spirits industry is very tight knit and, you know, it usually takes a phone call to figure it out. I started to also find different people that had specific strengths in different things. For example, compliance and bottling, co-packing, um, forecasting, where to buy barrels, where to find good barrels, who has new fill production capacity, um, who's growing, who's expanding. And it just kind of evolved from that. And then once, of course, when Steve passed, a lot of his people still needed help. So then they started calling me and then I needed help. You know, I need to find barrels because it went from people that needed three or four barrels to people that needed 500, 600 to 5,000 barrels. And it's like, well, I don't have 5,000 barrels, so I need to start really working on it. 
so by then I, you know, I talked with, uh, you know, White Dog had already knew Mark Harris, who unfortunately, you know, passed away a couple of weeks ago. It seems like, you know, all, all, all that old guard now is unfortunately all passing. Re, I knew Mark Harris. He introduced me to Tyler Harris. I had known Terry Tome for a number of years. He had been in the industry. Um, Dave Shirk introduced me to his daughter, Stephanie, who was in the industry. Um, and, you know, Michael Shore and all these guys that have that had, if we go back four or five years ago, were kind of the savvy investors that started laying down barrels. And now they're all coming of age. But it also happened, too, that as the larger companies were looking at their forecast and model, both on case sales production and what they want to do and what new markets they were going into, they would, they're would they always looking at their barrel inventory and they would say, OK, we got a surplus. We're going to move some of them. The problem working with the bigger guys, though, is that they know what they have and they're willing to charge and you have to take an MOQ of like 5,000 barrels. Yeah, so which now, is so now you bring very a difficult. bunch of these other people. Right. So, you know, it's just a matter of me having conversations and meeting people. And then, you know, we started really honing in and better understanding and my perspective, better understanding yields, what barrels are more marketable than others, what barrels are used more for foundational style spirits, what barrels are sourced uh, a little bit more than others, which ones are, and that's why I say more marketable. And, and what I found too, is that as we continue to go down, like right now I have access to like 30,000 barrels on my sale list. So right now we're very much in a buyer's market. But if we go back a couple of years ago, it's definitely a seller's market. Oh, yeah, like yeah. we're talking, when we say a couple of years, I mean, it's literally two to three years. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. Absolutely. You know, and and if we go back four or five or years even. ago, I, I think I think the pendulum that really made it shift at all was the investors, the venture capitalists, and the hedge fund guys really coming in and making this look like as an investment. I, though, sometimes think as now as I'm having these calls with a lot of these investors that aren't necessarily at the point where they're panicking, but they're trying to wrap their head around, what do we do next? All this stuff is four or five years old. So now you're at the ultra premium of what your yield is going to produce based on the maximum that you're going to get for your yield, both on your shelf space as well as what comes out of the barrel. And I don't know if they were fed bad information, but a lot of them don't either A, understand the concept of the yield, but B, ultimately this stuff all has to go into a bottle or you got to sell it. And a lot of times they didn't have an out. Where do I sell 15,000 barrels of four-year-old while I'm still need to hit my minimum or my reserve in order to keep my investors happy? The days of- Yeah, because a lot of them, they don't have brands that well, yeah, that's that's right. behind them. They're, ultimately, this all has to go into a bottle. And ultimately, at the end of the day, barrels were never meant to be moved and bought and sold. They're meant to be filled, put in a warehouse and forgotten about. So it just became this huge thing where people are buying and selling. And, and four years ago- you know, if we go back four years ago when people started laying it down, barrels were worth more than brands. Now we're starting to see a shift back to brands being more exclusive than barrels because the price of barrels are going down. So now we got into a conversation where people were willing to trade four-year-old barrels for more two-year-old barrels because they either weren't ready to fill or they realized the value in it. So I can get two for one, for example, and two-year-old, and then I just let it ride. But, you know, the price has gone down, um, and I think it's going to continue to go down because, of course, the benchmark is a four-year-old Kentucky, and then there's everything else. Everything else usually teeters around 18 to 23 percent less. Um, so you can always get it cheaper, but you don't always have necessarily the providence of, of being a Kentucky bourbon, which kind of leads the path of everything. So it just kind of evolved from there. And as I started working with larger brands, you know, people would just call me, you know, that I have NDAs with even large companies and say, help us to understand that. Because at the end of the day, they realize the spirits industry is still very small. But even though you're big, you still need to have your conversations, your relationships with other people with boots on the ground. I've taken a several calls now with, with a lot of these venture capitalists that actually have consulting firms now, and they're still kind of kicking around the idea of getting into it. And I'm telling them now, you you're might, about, you you're might about two passed. or three years late. Yeah, yeah. And you, then you start explaining it to them as far as capacity and the amount of distilleries that are going to be coming online in the next three to five years. I'm like, big, big distilleries. So you know, if you look at it, in my opinion, the the market itself is only going to continue to saturate. You know, if we take into effect all the distilleries, and of course, you really only get pressed now if you open up a hundred million dollar facility. That's true. And they're coming out all the time. So you figure a hundred million a hundred million dollar facility is going to give you between a hundred to one hundred and fifty thousand barrels a year. So let's say you have five. You know, and if they hit minimum capacity, let's say it's fifty thousand barrels, you have maximum you now two hundred fifty thousand barrels going to be on the market in the next three to five years. Or if they all hit full steam capacity, now you got five hundred thousand barrels. They're going to be. Yeah. Meanwhile, everybody else is still producing too. So it's interesting that I'm still having conversations. But ultimately, you're right. This stuff has to go into a bottle, and a lot of these bigger owners of these hedge funds and venture capitalist guys never really had the plan to put it in a brand. They always had a plan to just sell it. But even still, when you sell it. A lot of their MRQs are so high or the prices are so high that they just can't turn it over. I'm not going to overpay you because you flubbed up your numbers. This is what the market is going to be willing to pay. It's challenging. It's a constant conversation. It constantly is fluid. Um, but, you know, the other thing is is because of the cost of 
buying Kentucky bourbon, it's forced a lot of other states, you know, like Texas and California and Florida, New York, Pennsylvania, a lot of those others really started to captivate a lot of that audience to say, hey, look, if you can't afford Kentucky, come up and try our stuff. Yeah. And a lot of them are producing good stuff, you know. And we'll get yeah. you a 20% off discount. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. You know, and we'll store it for you. You know, so that then there starts a whole nother conversation. Okay, great. You just bought your barrels. Now you got 30 days or 60 days to take possession of them. Where are you going to put them? Well, I don't know. I don't own a warehouse. Yeah. yeah, we got to find your warehouse. <laughs> that's, you know? that's, so, it's you a know. compounding problem. Yeah, it yeah. really is. It really is. Yeah, I think it was a perfect storm of, there, there was a lot of source brands starting in 2018, 2019, 20, that kind of took a lot of that sort, you know, and there, and you got to think Barstown Bourbon was probably, since Heaven Hill and Four Roses stopped, you know, producing and Barton mm-hmm. still did, but Barstown Bourbon was really the only Kentucky contract producer, but yeah. they were only making like, what? 5,000 barrels at the time, at 10,000 at the year. Yeah, I'm trying to and, remember. I know they have two massive columns now, but I think they so started off with one. When, when the, their four-year product came out, you know, and it, the prices were at $3,500, $4,000 a barrel. Yeah. But that's because there was no inventory. But now, like, so everybody saw those prices and were like, oh, we can get into it, you know, yep, yep, at this. Yep. And then, but what they don't realize is that, A, a lot of the source brands got wise and started contracts distilling themselves. Yep. And so either A, those brands have to outgrow what they intentionally thought they were going to do, or the overseas market just has to like blow up. Uh, otherwise, it's just there's just going to be so much whiskey. And and to your point, you're talking about they don't want to start a brand, but do they have to look at maybe acquiring brands to help move these barrels? You mm-hmm. know, you know mm-hmm. like instead of looking as the exit as uh, flipping the barrels, they look at acquiring a brand to help take these barrels and and put them on the market in a bottle. You know. And that in there, yeah, is is a great segue too, because I know in a lot of the consulting that I've done on brands that were considering selling, the first thing that that the acquiring company will ask is how many barrels do you have in inventory? And a lot of these brands have been built on sourcing as they have money or as they need them, as opposed to really building up the inventory. Because the last thing a company wants to do is buy a brand and say, oh, we don't have any barrels. Yeah. So now they have to go out and buy barrels and they have to pay current market price. You know, and then we even go back to, especially with a lot of these new fill production contracts, especially over the last 18 months, if we look at the overall cost of cooperage, you know, you could lay down a new fill of probably, and you know, BBC, let's say for around 18, 18, 18 months, two years ago, for probably for around 600 bucks, high end. That includes your cooperage cost and production cost. Right now, you know, new fills are teetering anywhere between 850 to $1,100. So there is a markup, but there is also the extreme cooperage cost. So it, there's there's been a real big shift, and that's why I say the the days of people doubling or tripling their money, even sometimes on two and three year old, are long gone. I mean, you just can't do it. And what's happened now in a lot of the brokering businesses, there's a ton of four year old and older out in the market now too, because now these a lot of these investors are starting to sell off, a lot of these brands are starting to sell off because right now there's more marketability in one and two year old than there is in three and four, because now new fills are teetering around let's say eleven hundred to thirteen hundred dollars. Well, hell, you can go buy a one year old or two year old for only a couple hundred dollars more and you got another year of age on it. So now there's a massive gap of one to two year olds. So now you got new fill that you're overpaying for and you got three and four year old that you're underpaying for and everybody wants one and two because you can't build a brand on either one. <laughs> you know, so it's constant. It's constant. That's wild. Yeah. yeah. It's funny how the market just it works its way into those situations. Yeah, you know? <laughs> it really does. It really does. And, and of course, you know, where, where there's profitability to be made, there's usually sources or third parties coming in. You know, like now people are getting into the third party cooperage business. So we're starting to see a lot more importing of European style barrels. Europe, you know, really never sourced a lot of raw uh, oak, but now they're coming in and they're going up against a lot of these cooperages in the state side and they're outbidding some of them for just raw wood. Then they ship them over to Europe, they build a barrel and they ship them back. And I mean, we're talking double on a lot of them to deliver door to door in the U.S. coming across the pond and people are paying it because they need wood. They need cooperage. That's crazy. Yeah. I mean, it's, and by the way, speaking of crazy, it's just like how insane this has happened in the past two to three years, because two to three years ago, everybody just saw this rocket ship of just yes. like, just going to the moon. Jump aboard. And yeah, people were, yeah, that's why you have all these distilleries that are doubling down having insane expansions. And as you'd mentioned earlier, there's a lot of other distilleries that are doing nothing but starting. And they're like thinking about breaking ground soon of doing nothing but contract distillation because, well, Bartstown Bourbon Company was a great example of if you do it right, this is what will happen. But that is going to be an anomaly at the end of the day, especially if you see this, because I mean, we talked about already, it's like you go to Total Wine or you go to a liquor bar and you go to a lot of our liquor stores, you just look at those sea of shelves and you go, oh, yeah. you go, who's going to drink all this? Yeah, it's packed. And to think that we need to triple 
<laughs> like yeah. what's what's there yeah. already is is kind of yeah. mind blowing. Yes, uh, and and so it's just kind of crazy how the the market has, has changed from all that. So when you're sitting there talking to people now, are they looking at it and saying like, all right? We need to just hold tight. Like, all right, four, or full steam ahead. Mm-hmm. Four year olds not selling. Like, let's <laughs> yeah. let's wait. Maybe six year old will be, you know, have more appetite yeah. for for buyers. I mean, kind of like, what's your what's your thought on that one? If you're anything like me, then you can't get enough about bourbon, and that's why I'm a subscriber to Bourbon Plus Magazine. Bourbon Plus is a quarterly publication that tells the stories from the heart of bourbon the farmers who grow the grain, the distillers who labor over the process, and the people like you and me who raise their glasses to celebrate it all. Subscribe to Bourbon Plus Magazine today at bourbonplus.com, that's P-L-U-S dot com, and use code PURSUIT at checkout for $5 off your subscription. Shopify's already taken the cash register online, helping millions sell billions around the world. But did you know that Shopify can do the same thing at your retail store? Give your point-of-sale system a serious upgrade with Shopify. Shopify's point of sale is your command center for your retail store. From accepting payments to managing inventory, Shopify has everything you need to sell in person. And with Shopify, you get a powerhouse selling partner that effortlessly unites your in-person and online sales into one source of truth. Track every sale across your business in one place and know exactly what's in stock. Connect with customers in line and online. Shopify helps you drive store traffic with plug and play tools built for marketing campaigns from TikTok to Instagram and beyond. And get hardware that fits your business. Take payments by smartphone, transform your tablet into a point-of-sale system, or use Shopify's point-of-sale Go Mobile device for a battle-tested solution. Plus, Shopify's award-winning 24-7 help is there to support your success every step of the way. Do retail right with Shopify. Sign up for a $1 per month trial period at shopify.com slash bourbon, all lowercase. And go to shopify.com slash bourbon to take your retail business to the next level today, shopify.com slash bourbon. When you're sitting there talking to people now, are they looking at it and saying like, all right, we need to just hold tight. Like, all right, four, or full steam ahead. Mm-hmm. Four-year-old's not selling. <laughs> like, let's let's yeah. wait. Maybe six-year-old will be, you know, have more appetite yeah. for, for buyers. I mean, kind of like, what's your what's your thought on that one? One of the approaches that I'm actually been talking with several of my industry people about is saying, okay, everybody wants offload by the time it's four. Four to seven is usually where everybody wants offload. So one of the things that I'm thinking of is like, okay, you can obviously get a three and four-year-old for pretty economical prices. What happens if you just buy it and you have the funds to just sit on it? Because what's happening now is everybody's offloading the four and seven-year-old. So now there's going to be a gap of anything, let's say, seven years and older. And we all know that seven years and older is pretty marketable stuff. It's pretty yeah. premium. So, yeah. yeah. So yeah. if you can sit on it now for the next three or four years, and now you're the only guy in the market that has nine, 10, 11, or 12-year-old, then you got something. Because again, it's 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 the separation. But I know that a lot of the investors and in the and the hedge funds did not play this thing out to go twelve years. I mean, they want to get in and out of it in four or seven because that's when the ultimate premium is. You know, the other thing that that we're looking at too is the impact of how it impacts a lot of the craft distilleries because a lot of the brands really are getting to the point now because the market has so many options. They care, but they really don't where it's coming from, meaning that. They're going to create their own story. You know, Steve always used to say, and, and I don't know if you can swear on this podcast. But oh, yeah. Go for it. Okay. Go for it. If we had Fred Noah on the show before, yeah. so that, that should oh, okay, immediately okay. So, give right. you so the... So he was a good icebreaker. Okay. Yeah. So uh, Steve always used to say, look, bourbon is 51% 49% bullshit. Meaning that <laughs> you you do the 51% corn, but the other 49% is how you present it. We're in the storytelling business. So what happens is now you're having a lot of people that are willing to buy barrels, do unique style blends, and craft a story around that. Because again, as I've you heard mentioned- i heard of that before. Yeah, but well, as you mentioned too, it, there's so many different brands on the market. So how can you set your side apart? Because at the end of the day, not all of us have ten million dollars to do incentives and buybacks with the distributors, or do shelf ends, or you know, have a bus that travels all over, or can do all thirty states, or at least the the big five. So it's extremely challenging. The other problem that we're running into now is that because people are also looking for more unique style blends, they don't want to buy from MGP or BBC anymore. Now they want to go to the craft guys. But the problem with the craft guys is because they don't make in such large scale production, they're immediately going to be more expensive. You know, a new fill for some of them is 
$1,300 before any markup yep. because they're either harvesting we, grain. We, know, or we all corn. know too well. Yeah. So, so. And they can only make so much. It's like, yeah. And they can only make so much. You know, like Kentucky Artisan, I think, is supposed to be putting out 7,200 barrels a year, which is re- very respectable. And it's a lot considering what they have. But shit, 7,200. I think Jack Daniels does 7,200 in a day. You know, so I mean, if that puts it in perspective, so it, it's it's extremely challenging. It's an extremely costly, you know, sport, as I like to call it, as you guys, you know, know this all so well. Everybody's really watching to see what happens in the next three years, as I alluded to with the gluttony of barrels. Now, the other problem that we're running into is, so we have the cooperage on the front end, but we also now have the stillage on the back end. So we have the economical impact in the state of Kentucky with stillage. Where do we take all this? All the stillage. I guess we need more pigs and cows. Yeah, well, it, and, and that's just it. So <laughs> people just have to eat more and drink more. That's, that's true. That's what it comes we need, down to. We need to make figure out how to make it into bread or something. Uh, we'll just have a buffet of bourbon. Yeah, that, <laughs> that's a fair point. Like because they're already having issues. Like you know, farmers not taking it or not using it as much, and it's yeah. like, what are they going to do with all this stuff? Yep. Well, it, you know, it, there's been several things in the last ten years that that has impacted our industry, not directly but indirectly. And and you know, when when the uh, I think it was the E89 ethanol subsidy ran out, people were all about corn, and corn was much cheaper. And then when that ran out, farmers got out of it because there was really no benefit for them to do it. And you know, processing facilities weren't making as much ethanol as they originally shot. So. Then we also look at, you know, back, I think it was about six or seven years ago when the bottom fell out in a lot of the meat uh, industry. So a lot of the smaller farmers that were actually making pretty good returns on a lot of their meat and raising cattle were getting it. And then they looked at it and said, shit, this isn't worth it. I got to run a truck back and forth to Heaven Hill and I'm maybe getting an extra three, maybe four cents per pound on the meat. So a lot of them got out of it. And it used to be there was more farmers and cows than there were distilleries. Now there's more distilleries than there are farmers and cows. So now you have uh, a big precedent with the state where they're looking at either biodigesters or centrifuges or, you know, other types of areas. You know, there's there's one guy uh, in Simpsonville, Mike, real nice guy. You know, he just really carved out a niche and he hauls, I think, five, five, six thousand gallon tankers a day picking up mash. And that's all he does. And he feeds, I think, 500 head of cattle. And he has a rotating pond that just aerates. But eventually, that's just a Band-Aid, too. You know, I mean, what are we going to do with all this? Because, you know, it, it smells like vinegar. It gets in the water system. It kills fish. It kills. So, again, it's like, what are we going to do with this? So there, there's a lot of problems that are kind of coming into it. And, and these are kind of the conversations that I have with a lot of the investors and a lot of people that are trying to start out brands. Because a lot of them, too, now, because it's also marketable and we're in the marketing business, everybody wants to go green and reduce their carbon footprint. Okay, that's great. It's wonderful, but keep in mind, there's only certain facilities now and distilleries that have the means and the money to really reduce the carbon footprint based on their production manufacturing processes. And I can tell you a lot of the craft guys just don't have those expendable money. You know, we used to go... Did Steve think about that? When oh, he would always talk <laughs> about it, but, you know, he would just say, well, figure out another alternative way. Yeah, yeah. You know, we used to go to uh, Kentucky Distillers Association meetings, and, of course, you know, we would have meetings with Brown Foreman and all the big guys, and we love them all because, you know, we're all kind of one big community, but... You know, for the big thing is the black mold. You know, everybody's, oh, everybody's the black mold, you know, the black mold. So one of the things that they came up with is they said, you know, you can put scrubbers on the outside of your vent fans on a lot of these warehouses to at least attract it. And essentially just it's a fan filter type thing. But, you know, a lot of these these scrubbers are $100,000 a piece. Holy smokes. I didn't know. Per warehouse. Yeah, it's a so lot. So I'm sure Brown Foreman brought it up and they may have gotten some. But, I mean, you know, the microcraft guys are looking around saying, shit, I don't have $100,000 to put a scrubber in my warehouse. So now they have to look at alternative means. So now we're pressure washing. So, you know, it's just, it, it's just. <laughs> I'll it, buy a pressure washer. Yeah. You know, it's, just, scrubber every day. It, it's almost just like, yeah, it's, it's, you know, it's kind of like I always say Maker's Mark did a brilliant because their warehouses are black. Yeah. Brilliant. 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 And you start seeing them more, except for Heaven Hill. I don't know why they keep putting white ones. <laughs> <Yeah>. I, don't, <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> Ours learn. were baked. Well, it's the like, ones, uh, to learn. the one, the white ones aren't, but the ones out in Barstown Road, those are black now. The newer ones. Oh, yeah yeah yeah, yeah. 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 Well, and that's one of the reasons why, you know, Heaven Hill or uh, uh, Peerless and uh, um, Angels Envy and all those other guys downtown have to move outside because of the class action lawsuit. So now they're going outside the other counties, Yeah, which is yeah. now a lot of the counties now are even now complaining and, th- and they're not offering rezoning in a lot of these facilities too. They were saying, well, originally we were going to put a five, but we're only going to give you three because it's black mold. It's unsightly. We don't want it. That makes sense. Yeah. I mean, yeah. It's, especially if you're going to be in a, an urban environment and the downtown location. They're not going to have that shit. No, no, I know. Yeah, the ones that are still down are grandfathered in, and they're not going anywhere, but there's no new ones going up. No. There's no new, if there is land, but there's no new ones going up. So another question that I kind of have is, is because you, you have a very good pulse on this market and what's happening here, and we've talked about craft. We've talked about big guys expanding, and then you have this something in the middle with everything of, of this brokering market. I mean, in your opinion, how difficult would it be for somebody that's listening to this and thinking like, you know, I really want to get into this. I think I can have a bourbon brand. I got a story. I'll just buy some barrels and put it in a bottle. Like, 
I mean, because you just said like there's going to be a surplus soon. Mm -hmm. So do you look at this and say like, this is the best time to get in or is this the worst time to get in? That's a great question. I, I think there'll always be an opportunity for somebody because, as, as you guys know, what makes your brand so special? What makes you unique? I, I often use the term a boutique style. You know you can't compete with Buffalo Trace or Woodford because you don't have the marketing or the capital to outspend them. However, there are certain niches like your brand and like Barrel Bourbon and, and you know, like Whiskey Row. You know, who would have thought, you know, we could grow that from 500 cases to 18,000 cases in a matter of 23 months. So. There are different niches that you can still do it and do it economically. The problem is, though, too, now is that you still have that whole other caveat of doing with sales, marketing, and distribution. You know, when people call me up and they say, look, I got $10 million. I want to invest in a brand. I want to buy $9 million in barrels. I'm like, no, you don't. Yeah. You want to buy $2 million in barrels and you want to spend $8 million on marketing. <laughs> That's where we you screwed know? up. We, should, <laughs> <laughs> we spent it all on barrels. Yeah. <laughs> and, uh... So, but but to your point, though, that that's a hard concept for them to realize. Right. You know, because then it's like, okay, great, you get all these wonderful tasting barrels. Now it's like, do you want to do single barrels? Do you want to do blends? How many SKUs do you want? Do, you know, are you just going to lead with this? What are you going to, what's your marketing look? How are you going to start picking up traction? So, uh, I, I don't. I don't ever turn anybody away. I, my my thing is like when when you met me at the uh, at the distillers course, we're there to really hopefully encourage you to do what you want to do, but be also conscious. And if we look at it from the standpoint that I would rather pay somebody to listen to them and talk about all the trials and tribulations, than look back and say, maybe that wasn't a good idea. So in a way, I just saved you a couple million dollars if you didn't want to do it. Right. But I, I always think there there's there's different yeah. markets. There's always different opportunities. Well, because you look at. I mean, people say this, you know, Fred is it's like, you're, you're too late. And I'm like, if there's somebody out there that's talented and blending and marketing and yep. putting a good product, there's new wines like popping up yeah. like all the time. And that you never would tell any of them like, no, it's too late, you know, yep. because that has been around for 200. That market's saturated. Yeah. Yep. And same yep. thing with beer. You know, if, if you have a good product, good story, and you can connect with customers by all means, but it's going to be challenging and you're going to need a lot of money and you're going to have to be good. The days of just like starting it, putting it in a bottle, putting it on a shelf, nope. Yeah, and happen. building in, they will come. Those are long gone. Yeah. Yeah, you're absolutely right. And, and and like I said, you can you can build a brand very economically, like we were talking about your facility. You just got to be creative. Don't feel that you have to buy a $6,000 barrel to think that people will come. You can be very creative with a $4,000 barrel or a $3,500 barrel or a finished barrel or a split barrel or a 30-gallon barrel. You know, there's a lot of different ways. And again, you're creating the story for people to come back. The other thing is that, you know, I often go back when, when when I got in the industry, about every five years, there seems to be a real big shakeup. People change, people build, people expand, people get fired, people die. You know, it seems like every five years and we're in the second five-year plan. But I know when I first started into it, you know, nobody admitted that they were buying MGP. It was just kind of a stigma. It's like, I'm buying from MGP. But then they realized a couple of things about MGP. One, it's consistent. Two, it's quality. And three, it's economical. And a lot of people use it. A lot of brands, people didn't realize. So now they look at it and say, you know what? I'm going to advertise that I'm using MGP because it's good juice, it's economical, and it's readily available. Now, I do think, though, that the conversation with MGP is, is being different now, has turned different because now they're in the brand business. You know, they bought Luxro and they bought some of these other brands. So now they have to look at it kind of not only from the standpoint of managing their cash cow of selling barrels, but also, too, we need to hold back. And how are we going to make ourselves marketable using the same juice that a lot of other brands right. are using? Right, because there's no shortage of MGP brands. No, there's no shortage of MGP. So, yeah. it, again, it's if you do it smart and you do it economically, you absolutely can make an impact on the bourbon industry. It's not. I don't think it's saturated yet. But one of the other things, though, is I do also encourage people to also look at other alternatives, meaning that if you want to start a bourbon brand, look elsewhere outside of Kentucky. It's tough in Kentucky. Oh, yeah. It's tough. Go out west. They always, well, Dave Picker always said, own your backyard. Yeah. And I, sh I want to put an asterisk next to it and say, <laughs> unless your <laughs> backyard is Kentucky. Kentucky. <laughs> yeah. My backyard is 30,000 miles well, to the left. And two, it's like, you know, we've kind of fallen track. You try to go into like where the big markets where everyone else is like Texas, Florida. Yep. Cal, you know, those are com really competitive markets, so it's harder to stick out there, and you're going to have to spend a ton of money yeah. to get noticed, yep. uh, whereas we didn't realize that. We, like, I mean, it's a learning we process. put all in the whiskey, yeah. not the marketing. But. But, but, you know, the other thing is, though, what's beautiful about this industry is that it's a learning industry, and people are always willing to share different stories and backgrounds. Yeah. You know, I, I, I use a story, and I think I told this on the, on the panel, is one of our investors in the Kentucky Artisan is uh, Austin Hope. He owns Hope Family Wines out in Paso Robos. Oh, wonderful yeah. wine. Love that wine. Yeah, fantastic wine, right? 
Well, I often use the example that he started a whiskey brand several years ago. And when we went to our distributor, we said, you know, look, we have a rye whiskey. We like to use it. It's grown at Waldeck Farm. We have all the story. We had beautiful package, the whole bit, even after a cease and desist from Maker's Mark. But nonetheless, <laughs> um, you know, we go, so we go to them and they said, we don't, we really don't need any more rye whiskey. And he says, I'm going to take my wine away. And then they said, okay, we'll happily sell your rye. <laughs> so, you know, a lot of this industry is also Man, leverage. Too. Exactly. You know, it's, it's leverage. Yeah, you know, he, you does, need he a a, leverage. does he want a bourbon brand? He may. I'll yeah. tell you, you know, he's, but, you know, to your point, if anybody's willing to get into this industry, it's full of entrepreneurs and it's full of creative people. And if you're willing to just kind of look past the people that say no and just keep going to the people that can help you find alternative ways, I think you could be very successful. If you look at the current trends, though, I, I do feel that, Malt, single malt, American whiskey, I think is still very new, but I think it would maybe start picking up steam. But I think a lot of those malts and those types of specialty whiskeys, I think will take usually a generation. You know, it's kind of one of those things where bourbon like scotches and in Scotland, they've been drinking it for generations. So you just can't show up and say, here, drink my stuff. Um, and of course, you know, tequila. Ziggo, Ryan, there's still time. Yeah. There's still time. <laughs> maybe, maybe it will die. I was just saying, you know, yeah, get them now. You know, don't encourage my own drinking, but as soon as they hit 21, here you go. But, you know, the other fastest growing segment is also tequila. And people are being very, very, very creative with a lot of the tequilas. But that is that is almost kind of false trap to the same thing that we see here, too, is because there is, as you could probably imagine, yes, there's a whole brokering market for agave yep. and tequila and stuff on the open market that you can go and we could start pursuit tequila tomorrow if we really wanted to. But you fall into that same trap of you're just another bottle on the shelf and then you've got to go back into the marketing spend. Yes, yes. And then you got to go, just like every other tequila, you got to go get a celebrity, right? I mean, that's how, that's how you got to sell it. So yeah, you're absolutely right. I, I do think that everything has a shelf life, but the other thing is that everything is cyclical. If we go back, you know, in the 80s, vodka was hot. Vodka was hot. You couldn't give bourbon away. Now vodka kind of wait to the side and then bourbon starting to pick up steam and then, you know, a lot of your whiskeys. And then bourbon now, in my opinion, I think it's starting to plateau. I think it's starting to slow down. It's definitely not dropping yet. And then all of a sudden you see now a lot of these RTDs. And then vodka got another resurgence with all the flavored vodkas. I think Pinnacle came out with 840 flavors. And now you got the tequilas and then you got all these alternative RTDs and now you got the single malts. And then I always thought, you know, Steve and I would always go back and say, we always thought the next spirit that would come about was rum. Fairly economical to make, fairly cheap. You can age it. You can pick up good color in about six months in the barrel. And it just never really seemed to, yeah, to loop know. on. I, 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 always, I, I thought when Fred came out of this book and I started trying, I was like, this is the, and it just hasn't like, just hasn't resonated with yeah. consumers like, like bourbon and vodka has mm -hmm. and tequila. It's a lot easier to drink a margarita than it is to get like a rum and coke, I guess, from, <laughs> I when know. you go out That's to a lot true. of places, you know? That's true, true. Like, yeah. we, all, we all love our Mexican food and they're not serving a lot of rum there. Yeah. So it, it seems true. like the, the, the natural progression of it. But, I mean, this is, I guess I want to also get just a little bit more of your, your crystal ball mm -hmm. thought process here, because as you talked about at the very beginning, we do see barrels starting to be on the decline. Yeah. And we always, we talk to Trey. prices. Yeah, yeah, sorry. Okay. I was like, they're on the incline, I think. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Those are on the incline. The price, drop prices are down. There we yeah. go. And Trey has, you know, always famously said that he was buying, you know, 15, 17 year Stitzel Weller for yeah. what, less than $1,000 a barrel or something mm -hmm. like that. Yeah. Now, I don't think we're going to see that day ever. Yeah, come. no, no, probably not. But kind of give your thoughts on on sort of where do we see it start leveling out? Mm -hmm. Because if we are going to start seeing, if you got 30,000 barrels on your book today, and maybe at the time this is released, we got 50,000 because there are more people that just came in as investments and they don't have a brand tied to it. They are looking for the easy out. And there's no such thing as an easy out anymore because- Brands like us or other brands are already putting down their contract distillation. They don't need, we, unless, yeah, as Ryan said, unless we are terrible at forecasting and we need more and your brand blows up, but that's not really the case that's happening. Yeah. So at what point do we start seeing this sort of plateauing? Do you see four-year getting back to maybe like 2,800 a barrel or something like that? Versus today, when in today of this recording, we're talking about July 6th, 2023, it's somewhere in the realm of what, maybe close to 4,000 still? Yeah. I remember we bought some four-year barrels for like 2,000 bucks, didn't we? When we first, yeah. When we first started. Awesome. When, we, when, when we first started, but yeah, that was yeah. in 2019. Tw Something like that. 2018, 2019. Okay. Yeah. Okay. And that was four-year whiskey prices then. I, I think... 
yes, I, it will continue to drop. In my opinion, I do think it will continue to drop. You know, in the last eight months, we've seen a drop between three to four hundred dollars on a four year old. And, and of course, there's certain you know there's certain equations worked in volume discounts and where you're buying it from. And right now, the other thing now we're starting to see is a little bit of a separation. For some odd reason, there is a there's kind of this just this storytelling thing going around in the third party marketing uh, component of it when you're working with brokers and sources that certain distilleries have more prestige than others. And those certain distilleries that have more prestige than others can get away with charging $100 to $150 more per barrel and nobody asks a question. The other thing, though, is that as there will still be the premium, so a lot of your premium style craft distillery, or excuse me, your uh, contracted distilleries will continue to hold a value, but they will only be hold a value of about $100 to $150 more than everybody else. But in the last eight months, it's dropped, like I said, three to $400. I think it will continue to drop. The only problem, though, that we're going to run into is now the three and four-year-old that's out in the market, even though it's dropping, you're going to have a gap because now the three and four-year-old in two more years is going to be five and six-year-old. And as I mentioned before- All we, the one and two-year-olds All the one and two-year-old that's already been gobbled up is really not on the market right now. It's not for sale. So now if you're not buying new fills or buying any one-year-old, one or two-year-old, especially if you have a brand, you're going to have a gap. And, and large distilleries have gaps too because they just didn't think that there would ever be a problem. So why would I, why would I not sell my one and two-year-old? Well, all of a sudden now there's no one and two-year-old. So I, I will think it'll continue to drop on the three and four-year-old and the older. Now, from an investment standpoint, like I mentioned earlier, though, if you end up having a three and four-year-old and you end up sitting on it for a couple of years, then you will be the only one with a seven, eight, and nine-year-old. So I think the seven, eight, and nine-year-old will always hold its value. I think, though, the four, the four-year-old down to the two-year-old, I think, will continue to drop. And we'll probably end up seeing that three and four-year-old. Four, and from a four-year-old standpoint, I, I, I wouldn't hesitate to say that it'll at least drop around $3,200. And I think it'll hold pretty steady there. And then I think the two-year-old will probably drop around twenty six dollars to $2,700. Because when we start getting in the new field of the one-year-old and the two-year-old based on current production costs, the margins between those three years isn't much. I mean, we're only talking a couple hundred dollars. So again, you go back and say, okay, now we're only talking a couple hundred dollars. Why don't I just continue to buy a three and four-year-old? So yeah. now I can put forth another three or four hundred dollars. Now I get a three and four-year-old product. So now I don't have to wait. I can essentially skip in line. The other thing that we're seeing now too is that with a lot of these large manufacturers, they have their MOQs that are such as you guys know this, that are such large. So what's happening now is a lot of the brokers and the buyers that are actually going in, they're actually buying those contracts and are standing in line to take the minimums that they have. So they're then either selling those barrels or they're selling their place in line. So now they actually have two different revenue streams. I feel like we're like playing like shorts on the market or something. Yeah, it like is. That. It is. You know, I had a conversation with a guy the other day who was out in New York, and that's what he does. He's a day trader, and he says, "God, this, this shit all sounds the same." He said, "I should have gotten <laughs> in the brand business." I said, "Well, maybe you should have, but believe me, he's doing okay." But yeah, so there, there's always these different ways to do it. But to answer your question, the short of it is, yes, I will. I, I feel very comfortable saying that it'll go down, and I think the next two to three years is these others but you still think it'll kind of come online. Psst. Bottom out at thirty two hundred for four year. You think? I think thirty two hundred is where I'm going to feel comfortable in the next two or three years on a four year. Now, occasionally you may get a thirty one to three thousand if if the investors start getting itchy, and that's where the big if is right now. The big guys already have their forecast model out six, seven, eight years. You know, makers and all these other jokers. The smaller guys, they don't have such large scale production needs. So what's going to happen is now you have these investors, these venture capitalists. Their floodgate hasn't opened yet. And you know as well as I know that they're all watching to see who's the first guy to flinch. And when one guy flinches, then the other guy's going to flinch. And then the other guy's going to flinch. And then that's going to force the price. Um, you know, about eight months ago when um, when MGP ended, or well, if we go back 18 months ago, when MGP bought Luxro, we saw an MGP price decline. When Wilderness Trail was bought by Campari, we saw Wilderness Trail drop down because, of course, there was some legalities and some other issues. And what happened was there was a lot of times where a lot of the barrels from Wilderness Trail were forced out into the market because they had to get out of the warehouses. We saw that with Campari. When Campari bought Wild Turkey, Wild Turkey did the same thing because Jefferson's was doing a lot of sourcing with them because they didn't have facility at the time. So Campari came in and said, we'll honor your contract, but you got to, for example, take 18,000 barrels in the next 30 days. Otherwise, you're in breach of contract we're not going to make for you anymore. So they have the upper hand. And that's why I always say in this business, he who has the most lawyers wins. <laughs> no, no. The bankers and lawyers well, yeah, always, they always win. win. So, <laughs> so there's two big gifts. There's two big gifts on the price even going down more. I, th I find comfortable saying that it's $3,200. But the other two big gifts are what are the venture capitalists and the finance years going to do that have, that have invested in this very heavily? And we're talking millions of barrels. I mean, we're talking yeah. hundreds oh, of millions yeah. of dollars. Right. Millions of barrels. What are they going to do? 
But then the other thing is, what are the larger brands going to do? Because occasionally the larger brands will sell barrels based on if their case sales are, are, aren't that good. We saw it with um, Diageo a couple of years ago with the Dickel Juice. We saw it with Beam a couple of years ago. We saw it with Wild Turkey. Their case sales weren't that great. Of course, COVID had an impact because what had happened was a lot of a lot of the distilleries didn't know what would happen with COVID. So they actually kept a bottling as if they were shipping overseas and moving and, and selling on-premise and off-premise. They kept bottling. So as soon as COVID, quote unquote, was over... They just started then tapping into their finished case goods, which didn't age anymore. Meanwhile, they haven't been dumping as many barrels to keep up with bottling. Right. So now they have a surplus. So now they're saying, well, shoot. Well, and too, there's there's a big problem with distributors. You know, it bought, you know, Pantry bought during 2020, 21, yep. 22, and then yep. they're sitting on a ton of inventory and, you know, the distribution warehouses. So they're not ordering as much as yeah, so they just, used to. And so they're just like, backs <laughs> up. It just backs up. Yeah. And so. You know, even the big guys will need cash too, because they're big machines that burn money just as ten times faster than we do, or a hundred <laughs> times faster than we yeah, do. So. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, you bring a different dynamic. I didn't even think about it before as we start kind of wrapping up. Is that yes, we we think of the the Bardstowns, we think of the MGPs of the world, but we totally forget that one aspect of like, oh yeah, you used to get wild turkey and Jim Beam and all this other kind of stuff. Because as you mentioned, if they don't hit their case sales, they just offload barrels. And there's people like us that'll look at it and go, ooh. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Hell yeah. For I want sure. them to have an ill for, for you know, 5,000 barrels, but you got to buy 5,000 barrels. Yeah. And we want cash within 48 hours. <laughs> <laughs> well, so that's where a broker comes in the middle. They Correct. buy it and then they piece part it out because Correct. I like those minimum quantities when it's like only four barrels. Yes. Because <laughs> that yes. fits on a pallet. Yes. And and and, and, and don't get me wrong, you know, I, I brokers and, and sourcers, you know, they don't always get the best names, and they are very good people, and they all are trying to make a, a business and a dollar out of this. But at the same time, they have been able to help a lot of those smaller types of brands, been able to penetrate the market on saying, look, I only need four barrels I can take care of. You. I only need 10 barrels. Oh, and by the way, I can also store them for you. So it has helped. But in a lot of ways, though, too, like to your point, it does. It shuts out a lot of the smaller guys because they can go in because they have the capital and the expenditure and the contract warehousing to say, I'll take your 5,000 barrels. Yeah. I'll take it. No problem. And you can always tell when a big distillery is released – some barrels out in the wild. Next thing you know, every source brand has a <laughs> yeah, same, <absolutely>. year, <laughs> same, <laughs> same age stated. That's right. That's right. <laughs> and of course, they never advertise it on it, but it's always into the story. Oh, yeah. <laughs> exactly. Oh, yeah. It's all, it's all the and same Sitting stuff. in the warehouses. <laughs> yeah. 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 <laughs> this yeah. one was tinkered all the way back from London and made it back. It was like, oh, yeah. It, oh, you and 20 other people. I get it. Oh, it's, yeah. yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah. And you sign the NDAs and you work through these warehouses and they that say, and all the barrels on the right-hand side you never saw before in your entire life. Oh, okay. Yeah. <laughs> uh-huh. How weird. Well, Jeremy, I want to say thank you so much for coming yeah, on the show. Yeah, my pleasure. I mean, I love this conversation. Oh, yeah. this we could was, talk for two hours. This was a, uh, yeah, I mean, this was, a, this was fantastic because we get to dive into something that we're passionate about on, on this side of the table is, is having a brand and understanding what this market looks like. And I feel like that's one of those things that we've been able to make this show take it to the next levels because our listeners now understand mm-hmm. that there is this whole other business model that is Never ever seen existed because most people walk in, they go, oh, look at this 30-foot column still. This is where all the magic happens. Yeah. It's like, they've romanticized. Well. <laughs> <laughs> this industry has done That's a great sexy job stuff. Yeah, romanticizing yeah, yeah. that part where there's this whole 90% of the stuff behind the scenes is what really takes that yeah, they don't yeah. know about. Yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I mean, like, until you realize that big brand missed out on their projections and now they're sitting on 50,000 cases in a warehouse. So they got to go sell off barrels That's and right. make up for it, right? So it's just one of those things. But Jeremy, for people that want to follow you, get to know more about you or learn more about what you're doing, how do they how do they do that? You know, I'm, I'm you in the shadows. Yeah, I mean, I mean, I'm just kind of most the guy brokers behind. are. They yeah. want to be in the shadows. You know, it, it's it, I no, I'm surprised you came on. <laughs> <laughs> I kind of joke. It's like this, this thing of ours, you know, type thing. But no, you, you know, I've never really been on social media, and I've been so blessed and 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 been around good people that have either you know hustled my name out or just had conversation where they said, "Hey, look, call this guy." And I may be not not be the perfect fit for everybody, but you know, one of the things is I I hope to at least empower enough people to educate them enough to where they if they feel uncomfortable that they can go out and have these conversations because a lot of my day is just making introductions and helping people try to solve it. You know, Steve always instilled in me too that if the industry is good to you, get back to the industry. And over the last 10 plus years, the industry has been very good to me. So the least I could do is give it back. And, and, and I may not have five hours a day to give you, but it, you know, it usually it's just a phone call or it's an email or, or a quick question or whatever the case would be. Hey, look, it didn't go well with this guy. Well, go try this guy, you know, and by the way, give him shit for me. You know, the, so <laughs> it's those types of relationships yeah. too, um, because it is, it's, it's very relationship uh, uh, driven. But uh, you know, as far as following me, I don't advertise. It's usually just, you know, a handshake. You know, for example, I'm going out to ADI in August, which are a big national convention. 
mentioned, and I'm sure I'll get some, you know, some business and contacts out there. And, uh, you know, but you can track me down. I, I usually go to functions, you know, and tastings like tonight. I'm going to third turn out in Oldham County is uh, uh, opening their bourbon bar out there. So I'm going to go oh, out nice. there. And, That's yeah. a cool place. Yeah, it's a great spot. So yeah. if you do want to get in cocktail, contact me. There you go. Kenny. You can be my agent. Yeah. Here you be go. See, that's how this works. Everybody yeah. in this business gets a cut. Yeah. It's finders, fees, and commissions. That's yeah. right. I only want three and a half percent. There you so that's go. Easy. Fair enough. <laughs> <laughs> that's not enough, Kenny. There we go. But again, make sure if you like the show, give us a rating, give us a review, share it with a friend, especially if you like the topic of conversation, because I think this is something that we could always talk about maybe at least once a year uh, of oh, getting yeah. into something the like this. The state of the industry. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Exactly. But with that, everybody, cheers, and we'll see you next week. Toodles.